Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons, entitled The Teachings of Jesus, is for the third quarter, that is, the months of July, August, and September of 2014. And this is lesson number 12 in that series, and it's entitled Death and Resurrection. It's the lesson for September 20 of 2014. I hope you have your Bible handy. We'll be looking at a number of Bible verses. There's a lot, the Bible says a lot about death and resurrection. And if you have it handy, let's bow our heads together and have a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, the, the promise of the resurrection, the promise of your victory over death is what encourages us and inspires us and assures us that we will be able to have a place with you and the earth made new. May that time come very soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There were two statements made way back in the Garden of Eden which are in stark contrast with each other. Let's take a look at those very quickly. Look at Genesis 2 verse, we really should start with verse 15 and read through 17. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. That sounds like a pretty scary threat, doesn't it? Well, the other contrast, see what the other side has to say. Genesis 3, the first five verses. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? Now, you know, remember the story, Eve has wandered over close to this tree. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the tree, fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Is that what God had told them? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, not quite. Eat. It said not to eat it. He didn't say not to touch it. The snake replied, that's not true. What's the snake saying? God God's, a God's a liar. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. Okay? So, who should we believe? Who's telling us the truth? It's, well, it seems like the devil or the serpent is telling the truth also. It seems as if he's telling the truth because they didn't die. Mm -hmm. And right then and there. But some people say the uh, dying process begun. Okay. Which... The latter part of his statement, though, is true. It's half truth that he's an expert. Yeah. Right. Well, he, he shrouded the the lie with with truth, with made it palatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How can That's why it's deceptive. Deception is the, is what was going on. Yeah. How can Eve know God, talk to God, and then see this snake, serpent, and believe the serpent against what she had heard from God? Well, let, let's be about, there are two or three things we need to say in her defense. First of all, has anyone ever lied to her before? No. no. She, I mean, she was accustomed to believing whatever anybody said. Because nobody would, nobody ever lied to her. But she was warned that there yes. was something bad. And if she had seen some mighty figure there looking like an angel or something like that, she probably would have run as fast as she could go. But she, wa she wasn't expecting a snake to talk. And that captivated her curiosity. I think it still would. Yeah. <laughs> and she yeah. had mm -hmm. everything at her, everything she could want in that garden. Mm -hmm. There was only one thing she couldn't have, and then she decided she wanted that one thing. Yeah. Human nature. <laughs> well, Satan certainly doesn't want to believe that sin leads to death. In fact, someday it's going to lead to whose death? His. His death, right? And all these buddies. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to fully understand the implications of these two opposite approaches, we must understand the difference between 
the sleep death, and the final death, which results from sin. What's the difference between the, what, well, tell me what the sleep death is first. That's what we, what we that's what our friends and our here. family have experienced. Okay. The death that we know, the death that happens all the time around us here on this earth, is called the sleep death. Why is it called a sleep death? Because the resurrection. Je Jesus referred to it as a sleep for Lazarus. Mm -hmm. He's sleeping, mm -hmm. and Jesus says, no, he's dead. And okay. everyone will arise from the sleep death at some point in time. Yes, everyone who dies in the sleep death will arise. Some at the second resurrection, some at the third resurrection. I mean, second, second coming and third coming. The first resurrection and the second resurrection. It's easy to get those things mixed up if you're not careful. What about the final death? What, what's, what do we know about the final death? No resurrection. No resurrection from the... Has anyone died the final death so far in history? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And why... But he rose from death, didn't he? Why could he rise from death? Well, that's what we're going to look at Is here. Is the final death when you are finally forsaken by God? When he says, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? When you choose to abandon God, yes. That's the final mm -hmm. extinguishing death, the perishing death. Yeah. Ceasing to exist. Mm -hmm. It was only because we as humans believed Satan's lies and distrusted our Heavenly Father that humans have experienced and we will experience any form, any form of death. Because sin separates us from God, we should all be dead, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, we, we already read Genesis 2.17, but look at Isaiah 59.2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And who is the only source of life? God. God. So if you're separated from God, where are you? You're dead. Well, God has chosen to keep us alive while living in sin on a kind of life support so that we have an opportunity to learn the truth about him, his government, and his character in opposition to Satan's lies. So why are we alive and breathing right now? Because we're on life support. Mm -hmm. And God has a special reason for keeping us alive. He wants us to learn the truth about him, right? So we're supposed to be doing that right now. Okay? Well, during his ministry, Jesus repeatedly demonstrated that he had the power over the sleep death now. We're not talking about the final death. He had power over that too, but which had become so common on this earth. We know of three specific examples of resurrections from the de sleep death during his ministry. And which were those three? Son of the widow of Nain. The son of the widow of Nain. Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter. Lazarus. And Lazarus. Lazarus. Very famous one, Lazarus. Well, jo God's description of the creation of man makes several things clear. Now look at Genesis 2, verse 7, and I put it in the handout mm -hmm. here. And by the way, if you are interested in any of these materials that we talk about, we, the, the things that we use here on our times together, they're available on our website at Theox, that's T H E O X, T H E O X dot O R G, Theox dot org. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. What does that imply? What does it take to make a living man, a living person? Breath God's and breath. body. God's breath. Whatever it is. A, a body which was made out of soil, God says, and the breath, the power of God. Well, Old Testament writers, and I'm quoting now from our Bible study guide, Old Testament uh, writers consistently held that a human is an indivisible living being. The various Hebrew terms usually translated as flesh, soul, and spirit are just alternative ways to describe, from different points of view, the human person as a whole. In harmony with this perspective, the scriptures use different metaphors to describe death. 
Among them, sleep stands out as a fitting symbol to reflect the biblical understanding <coughs> of the condition of the dead. And You oh. mean in the Bible in the Old Testament days, instead of saying human, they would say spirit. Mm -hmm. Or instead of saying human, they would say soul. Mm -hmm. And so those were other words that they used for a human being. But today, those words have taken on a little bit different meaning, haven't they? Yeah. Yes, they have. Well, look at Job's comments in, in the Bible. I wish, I, this is Job 3, verses 11 and 13. I wish I had died in my mother's womb or died the moment I was born. Why did my mother hold me on her knees? Why did she feed me at her breast? If I had died then, I would be at rest now, sleeping like the kings and rulers who rebuild ancient palaces. So he's saying, what are the kings and the rulers doing? They're sleeping. Right? Uh, but something's going to happen, there's other quotations here, something's going to happen in the future. And what is it? Many of those, this is Daniel 12, verse 2, many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and some will suffer eternal disgrace. Okay? What would be the eternal disgrace? Well, some people say it's forever, ever, ever hell. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, etern eternal disgrace can also mean that you are um, pulverized, banished, you no longer exist. Yeah. Well, death is the total end of life. Death is a state of unconsciousness in which there are no thoughts, emotions, works, or relationships of any kind. And there's lots of Bible verses, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6 and 10, Psalms 115, verse 17, and 146, verse 4. And that's, that paragraph is taken from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, September 14. On the days of Jesus now, pagan ideas stemming from the philosophical teachings of Plato had convinced many people that the human body is nothing more than a cage which temporarily traps an immortal soul which comes from somewhere lives in our bodies while we're alive, and then escapes when we die to go either to heaven or to hell. That teaching has persisted in various forms and is still prevalent today. Can you think of any examples? Eternally burning hell. Eternally burning hell. And who was it that said, you will not die? The serpent. Back in the beginning? So are we following his teaching? When Satan said that, did Adam and Eve cognitively grasp what that meant to be to die? I mean, that's a good question. I have to believe that God did everything he could or everything that he fairly could. You know, he didn't say, look out, you're going to find, you're going to see a snake in a tree. He didn't give them that much warning. But I have to believe that God gave them what he considered to be sufficient warning. Um, do I have... Well, Ellen White says, talks about how not only God, but the angels came and warned them about what Satan would do. There you go. It's the best I can do for you. It wasn't until Jesus came and died that we actually see the result that God talked about, the yeah. eternal death, not yeah. the sleep death. You know, the death which results directly from sin. Right. Yeah. Yes. We, we don't know how long she and Adam were in the Garden of Eden either. No. Could have been a month, could have been years and years in our time. Mm -hmm. no yes, Joanne? Some of these people seem to be inspired by Satan to uh, completely change God's creation. Plato uh, redefined creation of man and Darwin redefined creation of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, they are completely changing our present idea of creation. Sure. They want to eliminate God. They want God out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Well, what can we learn about death from the very words of Jesus? A famous passage that many Christians will quote is found in Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus said to him, I'm reading from my Good News Bible, Jesus said to him, I promise you that today you will be in paradise with me. 
Now, isn't that positive proof that people go to heaven or to hell at the time when they die? No. No? <laughs> no? no where you put those we're today in English the comma. is not necessarily in <laughs> the original no comma. tongue. In the original, well, in the Greek that we have, in the, in the Gospels, it says, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> And we don't know whether the comma is supposed to come before or after because in the earliest, in the original Greek, there was no punctuation. You had to decide where the punctuation is supposed to go yourself. That leaves a problem because what language was Jesus speaking? Aramaic. He was speaking Aramaic. Now, we have it only recorded in Greek, so we don't know exactly what Jesus said. So that's another aspect of this thing. Well, having said that, what other problems is there with that problems are there with that statement? Well, Jesus did not go to paradise that day. How do we know that? Because when he arose from the grave, he said, "Do not touch me, I have not yet gone to my father." John 20 verse 17, Sunday morning, he sees Mary, he says, "Do not hold on to me," Jesus told her, "because I have not yet gone back up to the father." But go to my brothers and tell them that I'm returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. So he hasn't yet been to heaven. Okay, so Jesus wasn't in paradise that day, was he? Furthermore, the legs, and this is the other side of the argument, furthermore, the legs of the two thieves were broken because they were not yet dead that day. Are we supposed to believe that the believing thief departed and went to heaven even before he died on this earth? Well, look at the verse. John 19, verse 32. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man and then of the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and so forth. So why did they break the legs of these two thieves? They wouldn't run away. They have to get them down off the cross because the Sabbath is coming and they don't want them running away. Again we read, Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life, giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. We looked at that earlier. When God's life-giving power is removed from the human body, what happens? That person dies. That person dies, what we call the sleep death. And if nothing is done to prevent it, what happens? His body deteriorates quite quickly back into dust. what we call the dust, anyway. Psalm 104, 104 verse 29, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. In other words, the difference between a living person and a dead one is what? God's, God's breath. God's power, God's breath. And Jesus has that power. That is why he could raise the dead. Okay, look at a couple of comments about John fourteen six. Jesus answered, this is Philip asking, Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. When Jesus said, I am life, what is he saying? I am the breath of God. Exactly. I control God's power, right, basically. Look at John five twenty one. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, in the same way the Son gives, to those, gives life to those he wants to. That's pretty, pretty aud audacious sort of talking, isn't it? Now, is Jesus's, God's breath, Jesus' breath, is that considered the Holy Spirit? Well, some think that the Holy Spirit is just God's breath and nothing more. Um, we have reason to believe that the Holy Spirit is a, is a person as much as God is a person. Um, so the Holy Spirit would have his breath too. Yeah. Okay. Well, when Jesus raised people from the dead, he simply returned the breath into their bodies. And as in the case of Jairus' daughter, he said, what? Get up. Get up. Give her something to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Look at that passage just for fun. Luke 8, verses 54 and 55. But Jesus took her by the hand and called out, Get up, my child. Her life returned, and she got up at once. And Jesus ordered them to give her something to eat. Okay? In God's eyes, then, those who have suffered the sleep death are merely 
sleeping. God has the power to raise them back to life anytime he wants, right? The three people mentioned in the Bible as being resurrected by Jesus were not, however, given eternal life. They were still subject to the sleep death once again. They all later re-died, right? However, the time is coming when everyone who has died in that sleep death will be raised to life again. Where's the evidence for that? John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead, how many? All, all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live. Those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. Now, when is the time when the righteous and the wicked will rise? Christ's return. Second coming or third coming. When I go but by this, this, this sounds like it all happens at one time. Why do you think that is? When I go by the Loma Linda grave, I just picture mm -hmm. at the resurrection all those Adventists coming up out of there. Yeah. <laughs> answer your question about why is it together um, we, I don't think that um, at the time even that John was written that there was an understanding about the uh, second coming differentiated from the third coming well it was John in Revelation that yeah. later talked about it well we don't know for sure whether Revelation was written first or, jo or, or John was written first but clearly all the other disciples were long gone before anybody recognized that there was a millennium. So it means that the everybody up until whenever Revelation 20 was revealed to John thought that it was all going to happen at the same time. But then suddenly we discovered that the righteous will be resurrected in Revelation 20 at the beginning of the thousand years and the wicked will be resurrected at the end of the thousand years, right? Wait a minute. Doesn't it say that the, those that killed Christ are going to see him when he comes back? So some okay. of them are going to be up. Right. A few exceptions. With a few yeah. exceptions. And what are those exceptions? I mean, what's, what are the circumstances there? Doesn't it, isn't it in the Bible that those who pierced me will... That's what I just said. Mm -hmm. And where would you read about that? Revelation 1, verse 7. Look. He's coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All people on earth will mourn of him, so shall it be. So the suggestion is that there will be a special resurrection of people who have been especially opposed to the, Jesus and his teachings down through the generations. They will especially be raised to see him coming in the clouds. Can you imagine being that soldier mm. that took this the sword or knife into the side of Jesus? Imagine being Caiaphas. Yes, I think the, the soldier was doing his job bad as it was, but the high priest, that's a different deal. Yeah, wow. But maybe you wonder whether others like Hitler and some of those folks. Yeah, exactly. Some terrible stuff being done. Well, look what Paul says in Acts 24, verse 15. I have the same hope in God that these themselves have, namely that all people, both the good and the bad, will rise from death. How many? How many people will be alive at the third coming? Everyone. With Everyone. With very, very few exceptions. There may be a few very simple exceptions. But basically, everyone who's ever lived will be alive at that same time. Well, and they, what will happen when they rise? What are they, why, are they, why are they being resurrected? Even the wicked? It's the final reckoning. Yeah. To face the judgment, right? And what do we know about the judgment? Ecclesiastes 12, 14. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. How will the earth hold all these people? I was thinking the is same that, Is that why this, a lot of parts per se, you know, the waters are going to be gone, you know, but it, we would need that for just for the earth to hold all these people well, and then some. We'll need a lot of porta potties at that time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Someone has said that you could take all the people who live in this world today and put them in the state of Texas. They would be, they would be standing, you know, within, you know, sort of crowded, but... I wouldn't, tr I wouldn't trust that mathematician. Two years ago, it was the state of Washington, and they'd have about 400 square feet. Now, if you put them in the state of Texas, now we've got a couple, a couple billion more. So, uh, but uh, you'd still have, you know... As early on, they didn't have the populations we've got now. Yeah, no. yeah, much less population yeah. than we have. But you don't need to have all no. the uh, animals to kill, and you're not going to be... <laughs> no. it, it's uh, a lot of people. Well, as a result of the judgment then, everyone will reap exactly what he has chosen for himself. Those who have chosen to live a life separate from God will cease to exist. Those who have chosen to associate themselves by faith with God will experience eternal life. God's judgment is not an arbitrary command of God's part which punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. God simply reveals the truth about each person's choices during his life on earth. Uh, where would you find that in Scripture? Does God allow excuses? No. Not at that time. <laughs> you know? No. <laughs> Revelation t uh, 20, I think it is, says, He that is righteous, righteous go on being righteous. I, I don't remember the verse. Revelation 22, verse 11. I'd like to read another one that is a little more specific about the judgment itself. Look at John 3, reading from verse 17. Now, we usually quote John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, etc., but look at verse 17 and following. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged. Hmm. But those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. Okay, we want to see how the judgment works. Here's an explanation. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, light, because their deeds are evil. And those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light, because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what uh, is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So now, who's going to do the judging? We are, we are judging all the time, whether we want to yeah. be in harmony with the Creator, God, or be self-centered. Yes. So. Everyone judges himself. Right. The truth the, is what ultimately the, judges you. The wicked are looking for the, trying to hide themselves, and the righteous are coming to the light. So the one, the one that I wonder about, and, and I'm not sure you can nail it down, when does the saying, depart from me, I never knew you? Uh, that's Matthew 7. Right, but mm -hmm. when does that... It's almost like... At the judgment. Do they, do they, yeah, but what I'm getting at is, does everybody get separately faced up, or we're all on a different frequency, and God no, turns something, you know what I'm saying? I see. Mm. How does that work out? I don't think we totally know. No. There's some no. logistics that are very interesting to think about, but a God who can create the world, create everything that's in the ocean, and all the birds and stuff, he can figure it out, so it's going to work, but uh, we certainly can't figure it out. Well, Paul makes it clear how he feels about these two groups. Ephesians 2, 1 says, Some are dead indeed to sin, but alive to... I'm sorry. Some are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1, while others are dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, verse 11. Every one of us will experience resurrection if we die that sleep death. What happens to us after that is a result of the choices we make while in this life. What if, what if we're dead to most sins but not all sins? We're alive to some sins, but I mean, you know, there's no, it's hard to be all one way or all the other. We're, we're kind of like, sort of a marble texture, you know? Uh. <laughs> I see. I don't remember reading about any marble Christians being in the kingdom. <laughs> well, you're what we do have is... You're the tippid. sheep and the goats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to be tippid. Yeah, yeah. God, God has something to say about lukewarm yeah. Christians, doesn't he? Yes. 
Well, there is one story that Jesus told that seems to support the idea of eternal torment. What story is that? Rich man and Lazarus. Let's look at that. Luke 16, starting with verse 19. There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury even, uh, I'm sorry, every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Doesn't that sound exciting? Mm -hmm. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, oh boy, what's that? Yeah. Where he was in great pain, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So who's where now? Lazarus, Lazarus is in heaven. Is and yeah. Okay, Abraham. God is there with Abraham and with Lazarus. And who's not there? The rich man. The rich man in hell, right? The rich man, even though being rich was a manifestation that you were good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what did the rich man say? Take, so he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue because I'm in great pain in this fire. Did he uh, bother to help Lazarus out when he was here on this earth? No. Doesn't look like it, right? But Abraham said, I'm reading on, Remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he's enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us, so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. So God isn't omnipresent. There's a pit, at least, somewhere where God can't get over. I think Jesus was talking to people who had the Greek yeah. ideas of, of existence because the punch we have, we got to keep going there to get to the punchline yeah well um the punchline besides is, all, um, go ahead the punchline is yeah you, the rich man you, said go ahead then i beg you father abraham send lazarus to my father's house where i have five brothers let him go and warn them so that they at least will not come to this place of pain abraham said your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, This is not enough, Father Abraham, but if someone were to rise from death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from death. And that, that you could carry that out with uh, Caiaphas and all those people that saw to it that Jesus was killed. They saw the resurrection, but they didn't know what the Old Testament was, which, which was the Bible of the day. And they weren't uh, changed. Well, and who was it that Jesus is, he, you know, in the story it says, you know, you won't believe even if someone arrives from the dead. And who rose from the dead? Lazarus. He raised Lazarus. Same name. Lazarus. Exactly. But this is a real Lazarus, and he right. rose him. And did they believe? It yeah. just made them angry. Well, it was actually an ancient but non-biblical story, probably coming from Egypt, but popularly believed by many people. Jesus modified the story slightly, but used it to demonstrate that our future destiny is determined by the decisions we make every day in this life. There will be no second probation. But this story can never be taken as a description of actual reality. The fact that God is omnipresent disproves immediately the idea that no one can cross from heaven to hell. There are many other details of the story which are obviously incorrect according to biblical teachings. So why is it in the Bible? Yeah. Yes. If God, the Holy Spirit, direct the, you know, inspire the scriptures, why did he inspire Jesus to say this? Why did he inspire Luke to write this in this way? Well, look at some passages. Maybe that'll help us. Look at Matthew 5, 22. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother 
will be brought to trial, and whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought, will be brought before the council, and whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. Doesn't that sound like eternally burning hell? How do we even survive childhood growing up with our brothers and <laughs> sisters? <laughs> Well, look at another place, continuing the same parable. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, turn it, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than for your whole body to go to hell. How does that make sense when all sin begins right here? Mm -hmm. Then we'll be cutting our head I think you ought to be off. cutting our head, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think... That really means, too, that our prayer Again. to God should be, God, cure my eye. Mm -hmm. God, cure my hands. And ask God to cut the sin out of your eye and cut the sin out of your hands. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that we should have to mutilate ourselves. Okay. But God needs to cut the sin out of us. So where did the idea of an eternally burning hell come from? Greeks. Greeks? It was, okay. If you're de going to deal with Satan's lie there in the, in the Garden of, of Eden, that you don't really die, and God's going to give blessings and good things to the good folk, what's he going to do to the bad ones? They yeah. don't die. So it's not illogical with that presupposition to have a hell. Yeah. But if you start out with the wrong presupposition, as logical as you can be, you're still going to end up at the wrong destination. Yeah. 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 Wasn't it just preachers that wanted to keep people in church and so they would threaten them with hell? And well, that's one if of you're, If you're not here, <laughs> huh? Not just. That was part of it, but it started long before that. It started long before that. Well, the, the, the gospel writers actually used two Greek words, Hades, equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol, and Gehenna, a shortened Greek form of the Hebrew name Gehinnom or Valley of Hinnom, 11 times in the Gospels. In that valley south of Jerusalem, the Old Testament kings Ahaz and Jerusalem, I'm sorry, <laughs> I missed the line, kings Ahaz and Manasseh, and possibly Solomon, suggested by 2 Kings 17, set up temples to the god Molech and burned children as sacrifices. Imagine that right outside the walls of Jerusalem. And they, they had, uh, Israelites had some, or the Jews at that time had some concept of destruction. And he says, you're going to destruction. Cause, and they had the fires of, of the garbage pit was burning continually at the south side of Jerusalem, though mm -hmm. not far from the Kidron Valley there. Mm -hmm. So they, it was a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Now, why would they think the burning of a child would please a god? Well, if, if burning a small sacrifices makes him happy, and burning a bigger sacrifice makes him more happy, w wouldn't a child be the ultimate sacrifice? But why, why, You're trying take, to appease. why take a child that's helpless, why don't you just put yourself and burn yourself? I mean, why that's, do well, they that, have that, to... That, that, that might be Substitution, painful. very important. I mean, that for, <laughs> you know, if you want to sacrifice, yeah, sure, I'll sacrifice you, you know? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Well, the gods, their concept of God was not a whole lot different than the pagan concept. So if you have a, a pagan concept that it, and their God needs to be appeased, well, give him what the God wants. Yeah. Well, sometime later, good King Josiah, 2 Kings 20 verse 10, 23 verse 10, stopped that practice and destroyed those places of worship. Jeremiah, who lived in Josiah's day, predicted that God would make the place a valley of slaughter. Later, it became the garbage dump for Jerusalem. In order to eliminate much of the litter that was tossed there, it was kept more or less continuously burning. Thus, Jesus used the name of that place as a kind of example of total and complete destruction. What did Jeremiah mean by uh, what you read? The valley of slaughter? Yes. Well, I, eventually it would become at, at the well at the destruction of Jerusalem and at the destruction of Jerusalem uh, destruction at the Babylonian captivity destruction of Jerusalem at the Babylonian captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem at the Roman conquest. Both of those times, when the Romans sieged Jerusalem in AD seventy, 
they made a practice that anybody who tried to escape and was caught was crucified. And around the walls of Jerusalem, the crosses were so thick in some cases, and they would never take them down. They just leave them hang there. The crosses were so thick and the stench was so bad you couldn't even walk between them. So Jeremiah was seeing this in the future. Okay, now we come to the keystone story, John, thir John 11. I'm going to start with verse 38. Well, you, what do we know? Just the first part of the story. Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan in the territory of Perea, teaching and preaching. Lazarus, the, the brother of Martha and Mary, becomes very sick. They live where? Just outside Jerusalem. Bethany, just a very short distance from, just over the, the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. Okay? He becomes very sick, and what do they do? They send a trusted servant to Jesus saying, your friend Lazarus is sick. And what does Jesus do? He, yeah, he <laughs> sort of acts like it's no big deal. So finally, Jesus says, four days later, four days after Lazarus is dead, deeply moved, I'm reading John 11, 38 and following, deeply moved once more, Jesus went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone placed at the entrance. Take the stone away, Jesus ordered. Martha, the dead man's sister, answered, There will be a bad smell, Lord. He has been buried four days. That's a very important key text. Why is it so important? Because he was very dead. He was already... Yeah, there was no question. no question. Because the Pharisees especially had tried to say, Well, the widow of, uh, I mean, the widow of Nain's son and Jairus' daughter, they, they weren't really dead. Just revived. Yeah, Jesus just revived them. And they believed that the Spirit hung around for three days just mm -hmm. in case yeah. their, <laughs> you know, the body wasn't really dead. Yeah. They okay. have a fish in the Caribbean called, I don't remember the name, uh, that has something in it that's poisonous. And, you know, poor people, sometimes people would eat that without knowing how to prepare it. And they would fall asleep sometimes for days. They, uh, some, like in Japan, they would put him near the water and just leave him there for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And then the people would uh, wake up, but they would be kind of, because they've been, some of them have been put in boxes, they, they lost oxygen. But after four days, if they don't, they know, okay, that one is really dead. Yeah. He's uh, gone. Four days does it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Martha, I already said, this is a key, this is a very important verse here. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? They took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I thank you, Father, that you listened to me. I know that you always listen to me, but I say this for the sake of the people here, so that they will believe that you sent me. Now, let me stop here for a second. Who was there? Pharisees. We know for a fact that Simon was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' uncle. This is from the writings of Ellen White. And what else do we know about Simon? He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus might have been Pharisees as well. We don't know that for sure, but it's possible. So they were in the upper crust of the society. So everyone from Jerusalem, was anybody, would be over there celebrating, I mean not celebrating, mourning, the death of Lazarus. So he says, for the sake of these people, I'm doing this. After he had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, or come out. He came out, his hands and feet wrapped in grave clothes and with a cloth around his face. Untie him, Jesus told them, and let him go. He didn't say, Lazarus, come down. No. He said, Lazarus, come forth out of the tomb. Now, so why was this a big deal? Well, go a down really to, big deal. Verse 47, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the councils. What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy us, both our holy place and our nation. But I think they also had another thing. Economically, yeah. we're out of business. Yeah. Right. So it, what it, it, was a, it was a purely... An, uh, er, what they were saying is if, if, if Jesus takes over, if he keeps doing this kind of stuff, our government is finished. Yeah. You know, our source of income, the markets there at the temple and so forth, done. 
I mean, what do you, what do you, you got somebody going around the countryside, healing the sick, and now raising the dead. Mm -hmm. They couldn't cope. <laughs> the Sadducees, who included the high priest, didn't believe in a resurrection. Right. They so didn't believe a resurrection was possible. Yeah. So here is Jesus proving to all these people that it does With exist. With lots and lots of eyewitnesses. So suddenly, they're proven to be wrong. Okay, that's a threat to their whole paradigm, isn't it? Now the Pharisees have been opposing Jesus from almost day one of his ministry. But now, all of a sudden, what happens? Sadducees join them. Sadducees say, we've got to get rid of this guy. So now you have Pharisees and Sadducees agreeing. On very rare occasions, they agreed. Well, this is the day when they agreed. It's kind of like the Republicans and Democrats agreeing on now, something. Now, just a minute. Be careful. Let's yeah. not be too... Uh, <laughs> it's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You would oh. think they would be celebrating with someone raising someone from the dead, and they would. And he was, a, yeah, maybe he was a Pharisee. Hmm. Of course, by far the most important resurrection that Jesus performed was his own. His own. Jesus said that he could lay down his life and take it up again. Let's look at that verse, John ten seventeen and eighteen. One of the gospels that says they plotted to kill Lazarus. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't there John, was it? But I didn't see it there. But so, the I mean, they, I know Ellen White says only that. In John. Huh? The story is only in only John. Only in John? Okay, but, okay, but maybe, they, I, maybe it's from Ellen White, that's where I got that they, yeah. they plotted to kill Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Okay. John 10, verse 17. The Father loves me because I'm willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right to take it back. What's he saying? You can't even kill me. <laughs> Are you saying that in the tomb, it wasn't God that raised Jesus? Jesus raised himself? That's what he said, wasn't it? Look at John 2, verse 19. But Way that back in isn't that. often what you hear well, people we're, say. We're, we're getting there. Okay. Jesus answered, tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again. Who's going to raise him up? Himself, he says. And I quote from Ellen White, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Desire of Ages 70 of 85, paragraph 2. Why is that important? Very, very important. Well, why is what important? The resurrection? The fact that he raised himself. In three days. That shows that he's God and he has the power of life. Okay. Who else thought he was God? Lucifer. Or wanted to be God? Satan. Did he have the power to raise himself from the dead? <laughs> Probably made him pretty furious. <laughs> very furious. Jesus has proven now, when Satan said, Jesus is no different than I am. We're on an equal plane, standing beside the throne of God and in the courts of heaven. God says, no, Jesus is God. And this is his proof. This is his proof. Satan was totally, and what do you think Satan and all his angels were doing over resurrection, over crucifixion weekend? Trying to figure out how to keep Jesus in the tomb. How to keep that grave shut. Yeah. Jesus had tried, and I've suggested this before. When Jesus showed up on this earth as a baby boy, Satan had three objectives. One, get him to sin. And if he had been able to get Jesus to sin, the plan of salvation would have been broken up because God would have been proven to be a liar. And if he couldn't get him to sin, his next goal was get him to give up. This life on planet Earth is just too much trouble. Just leave these people to their own fate and go back to heaven. They're that not was, worth it. They're not worth it. And the third goal was, if all of that fails, keep him in a grave. And how successful was Satan? Not at all. Failure. He mm -hmm. struck out. He struck out three times. Well, read 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 20. 
Jesus proved uh, that he was truly God. And if Christ has not been raised, then and I'm reading from the Good News Bible, your, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. So looking at the resurrection of Jesus, what can we say? That there is a That's our guarantee that there, there is a resurrection. God has the power to raise people from the dead. And he has the power to raise us from the dead. He will raise us from the dead. Well, but, John, John 6, 38 and th uh, to 40. Mm -hmm. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but will of him who has sent me. Mm -hmm. And this is the will of him who has sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son believed in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise him again at the last day. He says that several times. And truly I say, go down to verse 47, Truly, truly I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Yep. I mean, it's, it's all it's just a neat yeah. package. Desire of Ages, 786, paragraph 4. To the believer, Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Savior, the life that was lost through sin is restored. For he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. The voice of the Son of God calls forth the sleeping saints. He looks upon the graves of the righteous. Then raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust and arise. Throughout the length and breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear that voice, and they that hear shall live. From the prison house of death they come clothed with immortal glory, crying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. And the living righteous and the risen saints unite their voices in a long, loud, glad shout of victory. Great Controversy 644. Satan has used his teaching that the soul is immortal to wreak havoc on many people down through the generations. Notice these other words from Ellen White. It is beyond the power of the human mind to estimate the evil which has been wrought by the heresy of eternal torment. The religion of the Bible full of love and goodness and abounding in compassion is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. When we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful Creator is feared dreaded and even hated. The appalling views of God which had been spread over the world from the teachings of the pulpit have made thousands, yes, millions of skeptics and infidels. The theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of the abomination of Babylon of which she makes all nations drink. Revelation 14, 8 and 17, 2. And that's Great Controversy, page 536, paragraph 2 and 3. Also in volume 4, the spiritual, a Spirit of Prophecy, 356. And if, yeah. if uh, people do not burn in hell forever and ever and ever, what happens at the second death? What happens to that person? They cease to exist. They cease Malachi 4, 4 says they're going to be like the fine, dust of, the fine dust of stubble that's burned. And when stubble burns, how much is left? Almost nothing. That's what will be left of them. Clearly the idea of eternal torment gave Satan the opportunity to misrepresent God in terrible ways. This is perhaps the most important reason why we should believe in the sleep death and the biblical truth of the final elimination of the wicked. They will not, they will not live in eternal torment in some everlasting fire. It is very important for Seventh-day Adventists to clearly understand these issues because one of our tasks at this point in history is to clearly explain the third angel's message. And what does the third angel's message say? The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Whoa! 
We got some explaining to do, right? That seems to say hell. Hmm. So we are supposed to be able to explain the third angel's message. Can we do it? Can we, in light of what we have learned about the death and resurrection and so forth, here in this lesson, can we explain the third angel's message? Well, doesn't the smoke of Sodom and Gomorrah That's gone up. Uh, go up the same way and Sodom and Gomorrah does not exist today? No. Is the same phrase said about Sodom and Gomorrah? Not about the smoke. Um, but it, it says they will, be, they will suffer from, they, re, they, they will suffer the results of eternal fire, is what it says. Okay, similar. Okay. The truth about the resurrection sets Christianity apart from all other world religions. Buddha, Abraham, Muhammad, and Confucius are still what? Dead. Dead. Only Christianity has as its founding father a God who has the power over life and death and will live forever as the king of the universe. Paul said, and I'm now quoting from the New Living Translation, If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of, in your sin, of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 19 down through the ages, especially in the first centuries after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Christians struggled with the idea that Jesus was fully God and also fully man. Some thought that he was only really God and only maybe a mirage as a human. Others thought that he was a really good human that God somehow took to heaven and made him part of his family. But we know, as true Christians, that God was what? I mean, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And the truth about death, both the sleep death and the final death, and what it says about our wonderful God should keep us rejoicing forever and ever and ever. I hope you share all of these views and you understand them.